Hello everyone, it is a pleasure for me to introduce to all of you uh, Professor Fris. He is a very important person in many areas of philosophy, in logic, um, set theory, philosophy of logic, philosophy of mathematics, etc. He is a pioneer in so many uh, research projects in several areas. Uh, well, it's a pleasure for us to have you here. Thank you, Robert. And thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here. And this is my first time in Mexico City, so it's really fascinating. So thank you very much to Maria and Dewey and everybody else who's been involved in the making this conference possible. So let me tell you what I want to talk about. Let me do this backwards. So what I really want to talk about is conceivability, and I want to try to persuade you that you can conceive of lots of different things, in fact anything, even things that are impossible. So that's the sort of take home message, you can conceive of the impossible. So I was delighted this came up in your talk. <laughs> um, but to explain this, I must talk about impossibility. So before we get to conceivability, okay, I've got to talk about impossibility. And nowadays that means talking about impossible worlds. So I'm going to talk to you about impossible worlds. But the technology of impossible worlds spins off the technology of possible worlds. So first of all, I'm going to tell you about possible worlds. Now, I'm going to assume that most of you have a basic familiarity with something like quickly semantics. Um, so this section of the talk will be reasonably fast, but it will tell you about possible worlds, then we'll move on to impossibility, then I'll talk about conceivability. Okay, so that's where we're going. So first of all, possible worlds. Now, um, I'm going to describe to you Kripke semantics, but I'm going to set them up in a slightly unusual way, just because it makes it easier to do what I want to do when we talk about impossibility. So we're going to have a language with our familiar connectives and the two standard modal operators. You can define the material conditional in the usual way if you want. It won't play much role in what's coming. So that's the language. Um, what about the well, an interpretation has four components. First of all, it has a set, I'm going to call it X. More normally in logic textbooks, you'd use the word, the letter W, because it's a set of worlds. I'm going to reserve the word, the letter W for something else. So X is the set of possible worlds. Um, at is the actual world. So sometimes when you have modal semantics, you have an actual world, sometimes you don't. You can do it either way. For our purposes, I'm going to assume that there is one of the worlds which is the base world, the actual world. R is a binary accessibility relation on X. So R is the relation of relative possibility. So what's possible changes from situation to situation. It's now possible um, for, the, for me to be in Sydney in a week's time, okay? But in a week's time, I'll be, where am I, where will I be? What day is it? It's Monday, <laughs> okay. In, next Monday, I'll be in New York, okay? And then it won't be possible for me to be in Sydney on next Monday, okay? So what's possible changes? And the binary accessibility relation tells you what's possible from where you, from a situation. Okay, and mu is a way of assigning truth values to formulas at worlds. So the truth value of a statement is going to vary from world to world. So in this world, I'm now in Mexico. But in a world where I forgot to get on the plane yesterday, I'm still in New York. Okay, 
So the truth value of a sentence can change from world to world, and new is going to tell you which propositional parameters are true at which worlds. Okay, here's where it's going to differ slightly from standard Kripke semantics, because um, new is going to tell you not only where things are true, but where they're false. So new plus tells you the worlds where P is true, and new minus tells you the world where P is false. Normally in Kripke semantics, you don't make this distinction because you make an assumption that wherever it's not true, it's false and vice versa. And I'm going to make that assumption here, exclusivity. Um, nothing can be both true and false in the world. The worlds where it's true and the worlds where it's false are empty. And exhaustion tells you that everything is either true or false at any world. Okay, so um, I'm going to keep truth and falsity apart. However, for the moment, you can assume that they're exclusive and exhaustive. Okay, so what now are the truth and falsity conditions of complex sentences? Well, P is true at W just if W is one of the worlds in U plus, and it's false if W is one of the worlds in U minus, and then the rest of the things look exactly classical, okay? When is a negation true in the world? Well, it's true in the world. Not A is true in the world if A is false in the world. Um, not A is false in the world if A is true in the world. Conjunction is true in the world if both conjuncts are true. False in the world if one or other conjunct is false. And duly for disjunction. So these are just standard truth conditions. Normally, when setting up a logic, you don't need to give the falsity conditions because they're simply the opposite of the truth conditions. But I'm going to keep truth and falsity apart for the moment. Okay, what are the truth and falsity conditions for modal operators? Well, possibly A is true in the world, just if it's some accessible world, oh, that's a typo, apologies. For some W prime, such that W R W prime, a is true at W prime. Apologies, so A is true at some accessible world. It's false if it's false at no accessible world. All these should be W primes. Necessarily, A is true if at all accessible worlds. A is true at it. And necessarily, A is false if it's false at some accessible worlds. So, okay, this is standard Kripke truth and falsity conditions. Modulo the typo. Okay, and then the standard definition of validity. A follows from a set of premises sigma, just if in any interpretation such that A makes all the premises true, and there's another typo, good grief. That's two in a row, sorry about that. <laughs> there should be a plus there, and a plus there. Okay, in every interpretation such that the base world makes every premise true, it makes A true as well, okay? So validity is truth preservation at the base world of every interpretation. Um, now, the way I've set things up, I've got exclusivity and exhaustivity. So that tells you the propositional parameter must be true in the world or false in the world, not both, not neither. And it's very easy to show that the same is true of every sentence, okay? So uh, it's easy to show that every formula is either true or false in the world, but not both. So this is really just Kripke semantics with a slight <laughs> variation of presentation. And since I put no constraints on the accessibility relation, what this is gonna give you is the modal logic that modal logicians call uh, uh, K, named after Saul Kripke. All right, uh, I'm not entirely sure how much logic everybody in the audience knows, and I don't want to rush through this and lose people. So I'm, sometimes I'm going to pause, and I'm going to pause to see if you've got any questions. So have you got any questions about what we just covered? Because if you're not sure, this is a good time to ask them. If you're not sure about this, it'll get worse. <laughs> 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 Any questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Anyone want any more explanation from uh, from what I understood? Is that A is true if it is true in every possible world? No. Okay. Truth is relative to a world. Okay. Okay. Um, if you want to talk about truth simplicita, uh, it's truth of the actual world. Truth of A. Truth of at. Okay? But strictly speaking, we're not going to be concerned much with truth, but it's truth of the world. Okay? So forget truth. We're only concerned with truth of the world. Okay? So that's, that's what this notation means. Um, so this says that this formula is true of this world. <coughs> this says that this formula is false of this world. Okay? So the validity of true and falseness depends on the world we're Correct. talking about. Correct, Correct. absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's where mode logic really gets its grunt, okay? Um, because truth is always relative to interpretation, but that's true in the propositional calculus, okay? What's distinct about mode logic is that truth and falsity are relativized to worlds in the interpretation. Okay? Good. Any more questions? Okay, so let's go on. Um, we're still on possible worlds. There are many kinds of possibility. So, if you're listening to a philosopher argue, and they say this is possible or impossible, the first question you ask them is, what sense of possibility do you have in mind? Because <laughs> lots of philosophical arguments are horrible, because they run different kinds of possibility together. Okay? So here are just three, and there are lots of others. Physical possibility, roughly what's consistent with the laws of nature. Epistemic possibility, what could be true for all I know. Deontic possibility, what I'm allowed to do. Okay? So I'll write those as phi, epsilon, and delta. So those are just three kinds of possibility. Now, um, in general, there's going to be a whole set of different modalities. These are three of them, but there are others. So if kappa is one of these things, it's going to have a corresponding possibility and necessity operator, which I'll write the diamond and the box like that. <coughs> okay? And each kappa, each kind of possibility, is going to have its own accessibility relation, which I'll subscript R kappa. Um, and the truth and falsity conditions at a world for possibility and necessity with respect to Kappa are just the same as before, except that you use the accessibility relation appropriate for Kappa. And I notice I've missed out on Prime there as well. All right, so um, what are we actually doing here? Well, we're moving from what logicians or mode logicians call a monomodal logic to a multimodal logic. So in a multimodal logic, there are different notions of possibility and correspondingly necessity. And a modal logic can have modal operators for all the different kinds of possibility. And that's what exactly what we're doing here. Okay. Now, in general, um, the various accessibility relations are going to be subject to constraints. So the way I set things up, I didn't actually put any constraints on the accessibility relation, but normally for different notions of possibility, that's exactly what you'll want to do. So um, if something is epistemically necessary, it had better be true, right? What's known is true. Um, to make that come out right in the semantics, you need a constraint on the accessibility relation for epistemic possibility, which is reflexivity that um, for any world, W accesses itself under the accessibility relation for epistemic possibility. If you've got that, then you get this. So in general, if you're concerned with different kinds of possibility, you will be concerned with the constraints. However, nothing much I say today will concern these, so I'm just pointing these out because they're there. There is one exception. Uh, um, there is a most general notion of possibility. 
Um, what you call this is kind of debatable, but to be possible in this sense <coughs> is to be possible in some world or other. And uh, I'm going to call this logical possibility and write it as lambda. Okay? So something is logically possible if it's true in all these worlds. So that's going to include all logical truths, presumably all mathematical truths, all analytic truths, such as all bachelors are married, and so on. So this is necessity in the strictest possible sense, or possibility in the broadest possible sense. Okay, um, so the accessibility relation for logical possibility is the most generous one you can have. Um, for every W and W prime in a possible world, they access each other. So every world accesses every other world under this Excel accessibility relation, and there should be a lambda there as well, okay? For our lambda then, this is what logicians call the universal relation. Every world accesses every world, okay? And so in particular, um, if something is possible in any sense, it's logically possible. And if something is logically necessary, it's uh, necessary in any weaker sense. So logical possibility is the strongest notion of possibility and the weakest, no sorry, the strongest notion of necessity and the weakest notion of possibility. And if you know some standard model logic, what you'll know is that that makes the modality of uh, lambda S5. Okay. So we've almost finished with possibility. However, let me flag an issue. We already have a problem here. Okay? Because this says that everything that's possible in any sense is logically possible. Now that is just not true. Okay? One of the most famous unsolved problems in mathematics at the moment is Goldbach's conjecture. It says that every even number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers. If you know what prime number is, you'll understand. If you don't, it doesn't matter. It's a famous unsolved problem. We don't know the answer. It's possible it's true. It's possible it's false, epistemically. Okay? But one of these things cannot be logically true. Because one of these is true in all possible worlds and one is not. So something has gone awry here. Okay? There are epistemic possibilities which are not logically possible. So we need to have some understanding of epistemic possibility which takes us beyond logical possibility. That's where we're going next. All right. So let me pause again. Are there any questions about this before we go to impossibility? Okay, we go on. <laughs> so, you now know what possible worlds are, but I've just flagged why you might be interested in impossible worlds. So, what's an impossible world? Well, um, if uh, there, there are impossible worlds, these are presumably worlds where some impossible things hold. And conversely, worlds where some uh, necessary things fail. Okay, now, I mean, for many notions of possibility, you just need possible world semantics. Um, <coughs> physical possibility, for example, anything that's physically possible is presumably logically possible, so a physically impossible world is logically possible, right? You don't need impossible worlds for physical impossibility, but you do for logical impossibility, as I've just explained. So some logically impossible things are going to be true at an impossible world, some logically necessary things are going to be false. And there's no reason to suppose that, you know, we need to differentiate between different kinds of logical impossibilities or logical truths, you know, presumably, for any logical impossibility, it's true at some logically impossible world. And for any logically necessary statement, it's going to be not true at some impossible world. Okay, now we knew that was true for contingent things already. Okay, every 
uh, contingent thing is true at some possible world, uh, every contingent thing is uh, false at some possible world. So what we've actually seen is the primary directive of impossible worlds. Everything holds at some worlds and everything fails at some worlds. That's the primary directive. So we need an account of possible worlds which justifies this. How do you do it? It's easy. Okay? You simply drop exclusivity and exhaustivity. If you do that, then um, provided you don't put any constraints on the accessibility relations, leave that aside, you can satisfy the primary directive. Now, I'm not going to prove this to you. Uh, you can trust me. <laughs> All right? We're not going to hammer through any proofs in this talk. But believe me, you can satisfy the primary directive if you drop the conditions of exclusivity <coughs> and exhaustivity. Um, so that's the space of worlds. Now, which are the possible worlds? Well, I haven't told you yet. What sorts of constraints should we put on the possible worlds? Well, they've got to be a subset of all the worlds. That's okay. The actual worlds have better be possible, because anything that's actually is possible. And because we want to insist that logical possibility is the most general form of possibility, then the accessibility relation on the possible worlds had better be universal. That's what this says. So those constraints doesn't tell you what the possible worlds are. Now, you've got a choice here. And your choice here is going to depend on what you think the right logic is. Okay. So, the answer to this question of what P is, is actually going to determine the correct logic. Just because validity is defined as truth preservation of the actual world, and the actual world is always possible. So we're really interested in truth preservation of possible worlds. So the question of what worlds are possible is really important. It's going to define validity. Now, suppose you think um, that classical logic is right, as some of my friends do. Some people in the audience may also do too. That's okay. <laughs> Today, you're allowed to. Okay? <laughs> so suppose you think that classical logic is right. Which are the possible worlds? Well, they're just the ones where exclusivity and exhaustivity hold. Okay? These are the worlds we had before. We've just you know, made more of them available. Okay? So if you believe that classical logic is right, then the answer to which worlds are possible is easy. Just the ones we had before. And those are the ones which are closed under the classical S5 consequence relation. That's not entirely obvious. In fact, it's not even true. There's one exception. Because in the semantics, there's a trivial world. There's a world where everything is true. Dually, there's a world where nothing is true. Okay? Um, the world where everything is true is closed under classical S5 deducibility. Because it's closed under everything. But presumably, if you're a classical logician, you won't want to call that a possible world, a world where everything is true. So the possible worlds are the worlds which are closed up on the classic slide, except the trivial world. Okay, so that's one thing you might say. Uh, here's something else you might say. The semantics I've given you are actually the semantics of a well-known four-value logic called first-degree entailment. Some of you may have met that before. So here's one thing you might say. If you think that first-degree entailment is the correct logic, then all the worlds are possible. There aren't any impossible worlds. Yet, hold on. <laughs> In these semantics, if you take first degree entailment to be the correct logic, then the possible worlds are just X, all the worlds. So these are kind of two extremes, classical and first degree entailment. There are intermediate views. So, um, if you think that there can be truth value gluts but no gaps, then you impose exhaustivity but not exclusivity, and you get logic LP. 
Uh, if you think that there can be true phony gaps but no gluts, then you drop um, exclusivity. Uh, you maintain exclusivity, but you drop exhaustivity, and then you get clean as three rounded logic. Okay, so you know th there are various possibilities here, and I'm not going to suggest to you which is the right one. All I will do is point out to you this. You can be a classical logician and you can have impossible worlds. So nothing I'm going to do today is going to challenge the thought that classical logic is right. But you will see that even if you're a classical logician, we can make perfectly good sense of the notion of an impossible world and perfectly good use of the notion of an impossible world. <laughs> Okay, what use might you want to put in possible worlds to? Well, I've already flagged one, okay? Um, come back to Goldbach's conjecture. That's epistemically possible, and so is its negation. So there's some epistemically possible world where it's true, and some epistemically possible world where it's not or false. So if R is the excess, R epsilon is the accessibility relation for epistemic possibility, it's got to access some impossible worlds. Worlds where Goldbach's conjecture is true, worlds where it's false. Because they're both epistemic possibilities. But we don't know which. However, one of those worlds must be logically impossible. So if you want a semantics for epistemic possibility, even if you're a classical logician, you've got to have logically impossible worlds which are epistemically possible. Um, deontic possibility. So sometimes you get into a moral mess. Okay? So I promise Jill that I will meet her in Chapel Hill next Wednesday. I promise Johnny I will meet him in San Diego next Wednesday. Okay, these I promise two impossible things, right? Or things which are jointly impossible. Okay, I've committed myself to doing impossible things, mm -hmm. meaning two places at one time. So, in a world which realizes my obligations, right? In fact, every world that realizes my obligations must be logically impossible because it has to be being in two places at one time. So, um, the deontic. Accessibility relation also requires you to be able to access impossible worlds, such as worlds where I'm in Chapel Hill and San Diego next Wednesday. All right, now at this point, people tend to say the following Yeah, 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 but you know, we're really talking about some idealized notion of possibility here. Um, in the AI literature, you often find this move made. Well, we know that you know epistemic possibility is not really S5, but for an ideal reasoner, it is. Now, an ideal reasoner is God, no one else. Okay? So if you want to know what's possible for God or what God's obligations are, by all means idealize. Right? For me, I'm interested in what's possible for mere mortals. Okay? And what's Obligatory for mere mortals. So this this move which says, oh, I'm only interested in idealization, forget it. Okay? We're talking about real knowledge, we're talking about real obligation, not no, some hypothetical god. All right. Okay, so where are we now? Oh yes. Okay, pause for a second. Any questions about that before we move on? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could say something uh, a little bit, a little bit more about the uh, notion of uh, steaming possibility. Okay. Because well, what what do I have to say? Uh, I'm thinking if we suppose that what is statistically possible is what is logically uh, con consistent. No. What, what I know. No. Okay. So. Something that is simply possible, if for all you know it's true. I'd like to know what it means. What is consistent with my evidence? Not necessarily. It depends whether you think. Um, okay, look, if, if you think it's consistent with your evidence, well, 
me? You mean? Look, there are several different questions here. Um, do you think Goldbach's conjecture and its negation are consistent with your evidence? Because one or other of those is inconsistent. A fortiori, it's not consistent with your evidence. So I certainly don't want to assume that epistemic possibility is consistent with your evidence. Okay? Because that, that, make, that, that would make that notion of the idealized one. Yeah. Correct, yeah. correct, yeah. Um, so if something is an epistemic possibility, if it's an open question for you in your current epistemic state, okay? Now how you cash that out, we might argue about, but that's what I mean by epistemic possibility. Is that okay? I mean, that for, for, for the purposes of this, I think we can, you know, just let it pass. <laughs> well, I'm happy to let it pass. I'm also happy to argue some more. Okay. <laughs> Look, um, we, we, we put the issue on the table. Okay, let's let it lie there for a second. Um, raise it again in the discussion period if you feel so inclined. Okay, because this is an important question. Um, I mean, part of my brief for impossible worlds is precisely that you have to go beyond the logically possible for things like epistemic and deontic modalities. And if you don't buy that, an important part of the case for logically impossible worlds is gone. Okay, so please feel free to raise it again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, there's a question which is okay. Let's suppose it is epistemically possible, but how can we ensure that uh, those questions are uh, the, the possible uh, truth values? Sure. So, what was the question? question? <laughs> like, like, for example, let's say we have a uh, mathematical problem, yes. a mathematical problem, which yes. is both epistemically possible for it to be true false, yes. but it turns out to be completely undecidable. Yep, then they're both possibilities will forever, rem forever remain open. Yeah, but then they wouldn't be uh, not even possible. It doesn't follow. Oh, it follows if you're a verificationist. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you think that mathematical truth equals verification, then um, you better go beyond classical logic. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you better believe in truth value gaps. Okay, and I, I, I sort of gestured at how to do that. Okay, um, but I, I'm not a verificationist. Um, for all kinds of reasons. We can discuss that in the question period if you like, but again, I'll just put my cards on the table. So you're, you're, you're both assuming, uh, for the sake of argument, a certain degree of reason and truth values? Yes. Okay. Um, but not just about mathematics, also about the past and the future, subatomic particles, the cosmos, okay? <laughs> I'm hanging in different rooms about all these things. I mean, you can be a thoroughgoing verificationist, and we know how bloody difficult that is. You know, Dummett has made the most thoroughgoing case, and you know, it's really hard to be, you know, an anti-realist about the past. Okay, okay, we can argue about these things. All right, um, but I'm certainly assuming that some things are true or false, but we'll never know them. You know, so whether the last dinosaur hit a tree before it died. Okay, I assume it's a fact of that matter. Are we ever going to know? Okay. Okay, any other questions? Good, okay. At the moment, I'm just trying to keep you with me, okay? Um, I don't want to lose too many people in the technical details. So where are we? All right, so, um, right, that was the primary directive. Primary directive, I remind you, is that everything holds at some world and everything fails at some world. That's not good enough. Because if impossible worlds really are anarchic, there's a greater degree of impossibility. Okay? The greater degree of impossibility is the secondary directive. If A and B are distinct formulas, there are worlds where A holds and B fails. Now that obviously entails the primary directive. But the primary directive can be satisfied without the secondary directive being satisfied. In the semantics I've given you, the secondary directive is not satisfied. So the consequence relation of the semantics, as I said, is first degree entailment. And the first degree entailment, every world where A holds, A or B holds. 
So in the semantics I've given you, the secondary directive is not satisfied because you cannot have A holding in the world and A or B not holding. Okay. So if you want to go beyond the primary directive to the secondary directive, you need to do something else. Should you? You should. Because whatever you think the right logic is, or might be, these intentional states, like logic, belief, and conception, are not closed under logic. Okay? Um, people's beliefs, I'm not talking about some idealized believer, I'm talking about real believers. Their beliefs are not closed under deducibility. Most of you believe, for example, the piano axioms. Okay? But you don't believe all the consequences because there's lots of things you don't know whether they follow or not. Okay? Knowledge is not closed under deducibility for exactly the same reason. Conception is not closed under deducibility. I can conceive that something is the case without conceiving that every logical consequence is the case. So, for example, suppose I conceive that um, Sherlock Holmes lives in Baker Street. This is logically equivalent to the following. Either Sherlock Holmes lives in Baker Street, or <coughs> Sherlock Holmes lives in Baker Street, and e equals mc squared. Okay, that's a logical equivalence in most logics. Now, I can conceive that Sherlock Holmes lives in Baker Street without conceiving anything about special relativity. Indeed, Conan Doyle could not have conceived anything about special relativity because he was 30 years too early. Okay. So knowledge, belief, conception are not closed under deducibility, right? So you need worlds that are not closed to realize these notions of uh, epistemic possibility, doxastic possibility, and we'll get on to conceptual possibility in a minute. So how do you satisfy the secondary directive? Well, it's easy. We're gonna do it by brute force. So, X are the worlds we've had before. Z is a new class of worlds. And now you can use W. Okay, so W is the class of all worlds. And Z are going to be the worlds that will deliver to you the secondary directive. So, it's easy how to do this. New plus and new minus apply not just to the basic simple sentences, the propositional parameters, they apply to all formulas. So, for all the worlds in this class, Z, it's true at one of those worlds, just if new plus tells you so, and it's false at one of these worlds if new minus tells you so. So, for all the old worlds, everything works exactly the same. Z are the worlds which are there to guarantee the secondary directive. And given that, um, the secondary directive is almost trivial. Um, and RK now is going to be a binary relation on W. So, the various forms of possibility may access the Z worlds. And you're going to need that because doxastic possibility, epistemic possibility, conceptual possibility are not closed under the deducibility. Um, what are the possible worlds? Well, the same as before. Okay, so um, whatever you thought the possible worlds were, they were a subset of X, the old worlds. Um, the impossible worlds are whatever you thought was impossible before, together with Z. So we've just expanded our class of impossible worlds, or if you thought that all the worlds we had before are possible, you've, you've, you've now added some really impossible worlds, namely the ones that satisfy the second derivative. Okay, that's pretty obvious you can satisfy the second derivative. Okay. Um,
Again, let me pause to see if you've got any questions. I know I'm taking quite a lot of time, and I apologise. You have to listen to me speak English, I apologise. But I'd rather take things slowly and try to keep you understanding. <coughs> so, before we move on to conceivability... And maybe it's because I'm behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you talking about how, how you constructed C, C and how is that related to V? To small, V? To the small V? Okay, so... Okay, where V plus and V minus. So remember that V plus tells you the world's uh, where V plus of A tells you the world's where A is true. V minus of A tells you the world's where A is false in the actual world. No, no, false. Okay, W, the world W makes A true just if W is a member of U plus of A. And V plus of A is? Just the set of worlds where A is true. Ah, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, and V plus of, uh, v, uh, yeah, V minus of A is the worlds where A is false. Now, when we were dealing with the old worlds, the X worlds, new worked only on propositional parameters. And given what we knew about truth and falsity for propositional parameters, truth and falsity for other things were delivered by the recursive truth and falsity conditions. But now we do. For, for, for Z worlds, we do it all in one hit. Perfect. Okay? Yeah? yeah. Please, pretty key. Do you want that the impossible worlds, there are uh, the worlds that not are possible? Uh, Axel, will you ask? Okay, okay. okay. Sending Mexico and then Axel will try to Le quiero preguntar si él quiere, si me puede repetir, uh -huh. si los mundos imposibles eh, son aquellos que van a ser imposibles sin ninguna adición ni ningún otro operación. Eh, es decir, si a los mundos imposibles que él quiere defender eh, no los hace posibles ninguna adición como en ese caso C. Ok, so the, the, I think your question is whether adding Z doesn't make some of the previously impossible worlds now possible. No, no. So it doesn't change the class of possible worlds. O sea, los, los, los mundos posibles siguen siendo los mismos, los mundos imposibles siguen siendo los mismos, nada más son un, un grupo nuevo. So all, all, the, all the worlds in Z, neither of them is impossible, none of them is impossible, and none of them is possible? No, they're all, all impossible. impossible. Okay. Okay. So, so I see. I'm sorry. Okay. So X was the set of worlds we had before, uh -huh. and however you cut the cake, P was a subset of them. Entonces, los, los mundos posibles siguen siendo los mismos, pero ahora tenemos más mundos imposibles, porque aparte de los mundos imposibles anteriores, ahora tenemos este montón nuevo de mundos imposibles que es el conjunto Z. Entonces, okay. sí, que, o sea, los que antes eran imposibles siguen siendo imposibles, pero ahora tenemos un chorro de más nuevos mundos imposibles. Mm. Okay. Okay. ok, so let me just clarify that. X is our old set of worlds. X es el viejo mundo. Muchas gracias. ¿Y con él? Sí. No, 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 she said that I shouldn't have taken that part. No, that she didn't. She did the concept. Ok, so X was the old set of worlds. P was the old set of impossible worlds. So the old set of impossible worlds was just whatever is an X in P. So we already had those. So now we've just added the worlds in Z. So the impossible worlds are whatever was impossible before, plus the Z worlds. We just expanded the impossible worlds so that we can satisfy the secondary directive. Do you want the actual translation? No, no, no. No, 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 she, she said that that was fine. But there, there's another class here. Oh, okay. So. This is okay. not a vacuum. Not a vacuum. This needs to have elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does. Um, it, it is very important because if we don't say that, then uh, this, 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 is not, this is trivial. Well, look, we're talking about interpretations, okay? And interpretations can be all, all kinds of strange things. So you have a perfectly good interpretation of modal logic with just one world. 
Okay? As a representation of what reality is like, that's not very good. So in the semantics, there's nothing that requires Z to be non-empty. Any more than in creepy semantics, it requires there to be more than one world. Okay? But of course, there are lots of models, interpretations where Z is non-empty. Okay? And if you want your interpretation to model what's out there in reality, Z is going to be non-empty. Is, is that okay? The answer is not, it is not necessary to, to make that requirement. Uh, formally, it's not necessary. Okay. Any more than when you do cryptic semantics, it's formally yeah. necessary to have more than one world. Okay? But of course, the interesting case is where you have these things. Because reality is like that. There's more than one possible world, there's more than one impossible world. Good, good, good. All right. So now we. Well, I have a. Oh, okay, go, go. Sorry. Uh, can we return to the part where you uh, talk about uh, how knowledge is enclosed and how considerability is enclosed? Uh, one. Yeah, there. Can you explain that again, please? Right. So, let's take knowledge. Okay. Real knowledge, not some idealized notion of knowledge. Um, Whatever you think the right notion of deducibility is, knowledge is not closed under deducibility. Okay? Just because any set of knowledge is going to have an infinite number of consequences, and we can't know them all. Okay? So, in the worlds that realize your state of knowledge, then it's going to have to be possible to have things that hold and logical consequences which don't. Okay? Now the second directive is a generalization of that. Okay? So it works for whatever you think the right logic is. Whatever you think the right logic is, then there have got to be worlds where some things we know, some things follow from that, and you don't know them. Okay? So they've got what so the second directive says that. For any distinct A and B, there are going to be worlds where A holds and B doesn't. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay, we go on. Okay, so this is where the talk really starts. <laughs> okay. So I'm interested in conceivability. And I, I took this definition from the Oxford English Dictionary, so of course it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> so to conceive in English is to take or admit into the mind, to form in the mind, to grasp in the mind. What's, what's the uh, Spanish? Para conseguir, conseguir, conseguir. Okay. Now, conceive means many things in English. Include getting pregnant. <laughs> I don't mean that. <laughs> Um, not, not getting pregnant, but actually keeping pregnant. Oh, can <laughs> see. Oh, in, in, no. in English, it means getting pregnant. No, it's getting pregnant. I don't know. It's not getting pregnant. It's there's something in Catholic theology about this, isn't there? Yeah, I guess so. We've actually looked in Catholic theology. Alright, but we won't talk about theology. Alright, so, um, what do I mean by conceive? Well, I mean imagine, okay? So, this is one use of the word conceive in English. So, to imagine is to form a mental image of, to represent oneself in imagination, to create as a mental conception or to conceive. Again, okay, this is the Oxford English Dictionary. <coughs> imagination. Now, what do I mean by imagination? I mean a kind of imagination that is used by philosophers, <laughs> mathematicians, logicians, poets, novelists, political reformers, visionaries, uh, anyone 
in those categories uses their imagination, or artists, <laughs> anyone in those categories uses their imagination all the time, okay? That's what I mean by imagination. All right, so conception is imagination like that. Okay, um, I'm only going to be concerned with conceiving or imagining that something is the case, right? There's also conceiving or imagining an object. So I can conceive that the moon is made of cheese. Like conceive of the moon, right? Now, for the purpose of today, I'm not going to talk about conceiving an object. The talk, the time's just not enough, not long enough. So just talk about, I'm just going to talk about conceiving that something is the case, all right? Now, here is the greatest Scottish philosopher, David Hume. And he says, it is an established maxim in metaphysics, and Max actually referred to this earlier, that whatever the mind clearly conceives includes the idea of possible existence. Or in other words, that nothing we imagine is absolutely impossible. Read the context from this text. It's clear that by impossibility here, Hume is talking about logical impossibility. Okay? And um, probably by logical impossibility, he means things which are either contradictory or implicitly so. So what Hume thinks is that you cannot conceive contradictory things, even things which are implicitly contradictory. So here's logical, here's Hume's claim, logical impossibility, and as Axel pointed out, you know, philosophers like David Chalmers try to make heavy use of this. I don't think it works because I've always been staggered that anybody could take Hume's maxim seriously. <laughs> right? It seems to me so obviously wrong. Okay, let me give you some counterexamples. Okay, we've had one already. Unsolved mathematical problems. Now, I can conceive of Goldbach conjecture, I can conceive of its negation. One of those is not logically possible. In fact, as a mathematician, I was a mathematician in a previous life, a mathematician has to be able to conceive of what something is saying in order to look for a proof for it. If you can't conceive of the damn situation, how are you going to look for a proof? If you or look for refutation for in a reductio proof. A mathematician must be able to conceive or imagine things which are logically impossible, otherwise they can't operate. They do this in reductio proofs all the time. Okay, logical truths, logical untruths. Look, I don't believe that intuitionistic logic is correct. So <coughs> just for the sake of argument, let's suppose it's not. If you disagree with me, just change the example. I don't believe that um, intuitionist logic is correct, but I can imagine what it would be like for it to be correct. I have to do this all the time when I argue with intuitionist logicians, right? If I can't imagine what do they want to defend, how am I going to argue with them intelligibility? Intelligibly, right? You must be able to imagine things which are logically possible to engage in this kind of debates. Oh, confusions. <laughs> uh, look, I can imagine that in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, deep in a trench, 10 kilometers deep, there is a pearl which is both round and square. I can imagine that. I can't picture it, but I don't confuse imagination with visual picturing. Okay. Um, there are lots of logical possibilities which I cannot picture. I cannot picture that something is a chiliagon. Chiliagon is a, um, a regular polyhedron with, I don't know, a million sides or something like that. I can't picture that, but it's logically possible. But I can certainly picture some logically impossible situations. So, look, there is a standard visual illusion in cognitive psychology called the waterfall effect. It works like this. You condition the visual field to constant motion in one direction. Then you stop it and you look at, say, a wall. 
and um, you get a naked after image. So the wall appears to be going in the other direction, right? But if you then look at a particular point on the wall, it appears stationary. So if you get subjects to do this experiment, what they will say is it appears to be moving and stationary at the same time. These are not my words. Go read you know, the, the, the textbook reports of the Waterfall Division. You can see that something is both stationary and in motion. That's contradiction. Okay, I'm not telling you it's a veridical illusion, it's not. But you can picture it, you can visualize it. Okay, so you can visualize logically impossible situations. Actually, you, you can do this for yourself. So, when you've drunk too much, <laughs> as some of you, I, of course, none of you would do that. <laughs> but if you ever do, okay, there's this phenomenon you get where things appear to spin. Right? <laughs> What happens is that the brain misinterprets signals that are coming from the ear. Okay. Um, so if, it's, if this phenomenon ever does happen to you, lie on the bed, okay, look at the, the corner of the room. You will see the whole thing spinning and you will see the corner of the room stationary, even though it's spinning. Okay? So um, you can conceive of contradictions. That doesn't mean you can visualize them, although you know, some of the things you can visualize are contradictory. Inconsistent stories. To understand a novel or a short story, you must be able to imagine the scenarios. Now, there are stories which are inconsistent. How do I know? Well, I've written one of them. Some of you may have had the misfortune to read it. It's called Sylvan's Box. It's about my old friend, Richard Sylvan, who died uh, nearly 20 years ago. And in the story, Richard, um, uh, it's just after he's died. And the two characters go to his property in Australia, and they find that Richard had found a box which was both empty and had something in it. And then the story carries on from there. Okay? Um, now, again, you probably can't visualize this, but you have to understand it to follow what happens next in the story because what happens next in the story is exactly how the characters in the story react to this very strange situation okay so to understand sylvan's box you must be able to imagine the scenario described so look, here are just four examples of situations where you can imagine impossible things in fact i reckon uh, I can conceive of any situation I can describe. In fact, I reckon imagining that something is the case <laughs> is just bringing before the mind some statement that describes the situation. So whether the situation is possible or impossible, if I can understand it, if I can bring that before the mind, then I can imagine it. Okay. So coming back to the semantics, there is a most general form of possibility. Um, in this most general form, uh, G for general, gamma for general, um, the actual world accesses every world, not just every possible world. So this really is the most general form of possibility. So everything is... is possible in that sense, at the actual world, should be in there. Uh, and I think that gamma is the possibility of conceivability. It's possible to conceive everything. Okay, let me just give you three objections and I'm going to wind up. So, I claim that I can conceive, imagine anything that I can understand. All right, objection. This, some of this is in the literature. When one thinks one is conceiving the impossible, one's actually conceiving something else. So I can imagine that water is not H2O. Someone says, yeah, well, you're not really imagining that water is not H2O. What you're imagining is that some clear, drinkable fluid, which you find in the rivers and so on, is not H2O. No, I can imagine that. But when I can, ima I can imagine that water is not H2O, my imagination is day ray 
I imagine that that stuff is not H2O. So, for example, I can imagine that, uh, I don't know, Obama lost the last US election. I'm imagining Day Ray about Obama, not some simulacrum, okay? I'm imagining that in Obama was such that he didn't win the election. Um, if I'm imagining that um, 361 is a prime number, I'm imagining Day Ray about 361. Actually, it is a prime number. No, <laughs> maybe it's, oh, I feel what it is. But, it's a day rate imagination about 361. And if I'm imagining that water is not H2O, it's a day rate imagination about that very substance. So uh, when I'm considering one of these day ray logical impossibilities, I'm not considering something else, even though I can consider that too, I'm considering exactly that. All right. Um, yeah, but if you remember Hume's. Um, that whatever the mind clearly can see. <laughs> right. So yeah, priest, you can you can you can conceive things. But it's not clear, is it? Well, I mean, I mean, what do you mean by clear? Well, you know, one thing you might mean is it's logically possible, right? Well, that turns the thing into you know, a tautology and a completely useless one at that, because you know. Often we don't know what's logically possible. So, you know, if by clear you just mean logically possible, hopeless. So, um, okay, I leave it to other people to tell me what clear means, okay? Um, but at least in Northern English and probably in, in Spanish too, if you tell a mathematician, hey, uh, conceive of Goldbach's conjecture being true, conceive of Goldbach's conjecture being false. And they say, yeah. I say, well, you're not really clearly conceiving it, are you now? That's an insult. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, all right. <coughs> Third, I, mean, I wouldn't even mention this one, except I've heard it so many times when I've talked about this issue. You are confusing conceiving with supposing. You can suppose anything you damn well like, but that doesn't mean you can conceive anything you damn well like. Right, look. It's true. You no. what is supposing? What's the Mexican? Yeah, okay. So when you suppose something, you assume it for the sake of argument, usually to see what follows. Right? And you can suppose anything you damn well like. Of course you can. Um, I am not confusing supposing with conceiving. Conceiving is a quite different thing from supposing. If you suppose, then presumably you do conceive. But you can conceive something without supposing it. You just use your imagination. So, imagine George Bush. Um, imagine that he likes dressing up in ballet dancers' clothes. Imagine it. Go on. <laughs> I'm not asking you to suppose anything, right? I'm not asking you to say what follows. I'm just asking you to imagine this whether it gives you pleasure or not. <laughs> so, um, supposing is not uh, conceiving. All right, I've talked for quite long enough now. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>
makes us change conceptual good, good, good. So, yes, yes, uh, for example, before, uh, I don't know, general relativity. Yes. No, I'll I, 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 I take your point. You're dead right, okay? Um, so I slid over some details, okay? Um, if you remember, what I said was that I can conceive anything I can understand. Okay, look. Okay. Now, so that's, as, as I set up the language, there will be things in the language that I don't understand, okay? So if I had been slightly more careful, what I'd have said was I restricted the language to those things I can understand. And you might even think that that cuts down the language to being finite. Arguably, we don't understand arbitrary long strings of sentences. So, um, I mean, you might think that you might not, but whatever you think, I mean, um, for the, the most global sense, for, 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 for gamma to, to be the, the logic of considerability, you do have to restrict language to the sentences that I understand. So you're dead right about that. And I stood over that because... So it would be the, the broadest possibility relative to a specified language. So that would be yes, good, good, good. And, and that's on the assumption that, uh, I mean, the, the sound of the language is infinite, right? has an infinite number of forms. So that, that's making an assumption that we understand all the infinity of senses. That may be an idealization too. So you may have to cut that back to a sort of a finite sub part of the language. But it has to be relative to the, a language or the bit of the language that we understand. Yes, good. Uh, you can prove different kinds of possibility. I, I'm thinking I can prove logical possibility in terms of epistemic possibility. Really? With with zeta with z z z z z no, the fact that something is epistemically possible, maybe that it's in, suppose it's in Z or Z, or Zeta, whatever, <laughs> um, that doesn't show that it's logically possible, because it may not be in P. So you remember that we had this bunch of worlds X, and a subset is the possible worlds, then we added all these extra impossible worlds. So we didn't change logical possibility. There are going to be lots of logically impossible worlds, and epistemic possibility has to access some of those. But the fact that you can access it under epistemic possibility doesn't show that it's in P. Do, do, do you want Axel to translate that? No. no it's okay? No, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, at the beginning, to talk about the constraints. Mm. Uh, I, um, I ask you if you, if you take, speak more, more about these constraints right. that specify uh, the accessibility yeah. relation. Okay. Well, th this, is, this is a, a tough question, right? Because there are so many kinds of possibility. If we talked about them all, we'd be here until tomorrow. Um, Probably epistemic possibility is the simplest. So for that, you really do need reflexivity, because whatever is known is true. Um, in the AI literature, you'll often hear people supposing it's reflexive and uh, symmetric, so you've got S5. Um, it's not really any of those. It's not, it's not even normal modal logic. And in normal modal <coughs> logic, anything that's logically true um, is necessary. Uh, and that's just not true for epistemic possibility, as we've talked about. So I don't think any constraints work for knowledge other than reflexivity. Um, when you get to other kinds of possibility, I think the doxastic possibility, um, I think there are very few constraints on that, if any. Certainly not reflexivity. Um, Dyantic possibility, well, something that's anything that is dyantic possibility is logically possible. That's Kant's maxim, right? Um, uh, possibility implies um, a 
obviously implies can. I don't think that's true. Um, so, um, look, we, we could run through the different kinds, and if you are interested in a particular kind, we can talk about that. But generally speaking, I think that most of these notions of possibility, even though they're all distinct, um, do not have very interesting constraints on them. Is that right? Alexander? Yeah. Uh, so, a question about the, the dialectics. Yep. Um, usually, when people introduce impossible worlds yep. in order to get some theoretical work done, yep. so, you know, such as you know, getting the semantics for kind of possible conditionals and, uh, yep. or, or uh, expressing hyper intentional distinctions. Yep. Uh, and uh, so, you set up your semantics, and once you have your uh, two desiderata, the ones that say that everything yep. is either possible or impossible, yep. and that for A and B, there is a world where A is true in this world. Yep. Uh, you can do all that work, yep. okay? So why do you want on top of that, that everything which is either possible or impossible is conceivable? I, I see this as, as two distinct projects, and I'm not Correct. sure Correct. why you also want the second part. Uh, um, everything is conceivable is possible? That, that it, Okay. The, the, the notion of uh, like absolutely broad possibility yeah. okay. is coextensive with So you're can, right. can I just finish Sorry. that? So uh, <laughs> the, the, what I was thinking was, uh, look, uh, you may be interested in the connection between conceivability and impossible worlds in order to have a semantic for conceivability. And in order to do that, all I need is that everything conceivable is either possible or impossible. So I have some world that represents uh, the content of what I am conceiving. But I, I don't see why we need the converse, so that uh, what is either possible or impossible is conceivable, which is what you say as right. well. Look, first of all, uh, there are different projects. You're absolutely right. Um, I didn't, yeah, you gave a list of things for which one might require impossible worlds, and I agree with you entirely. Okay? I didn't talk much about them, but this is the primary and secondary directives which give you the machinery to fulfill those roles. Conditionals, hyper-intentional notions, etc. However, um, the story about conceivability is different. Okay? You can buy all that without thinking that everything is conceivable. So that's a different philosophical thesis, um, but I gave you the arguments why I think that's true. Why did I talk about impossible worlds? Because since I think that everything is conceivable, I think that there are scenarios that realize anything you can conceive. So I have to describe what an impossible scenario is. Okay? That's why I talked about impossible worlds. So I had to do that in order to talk about conceivability. But you're absolutely right that that's an extra that's an extra philosophical thesis. That's what I tried to justify in the last part of the talk. I mean, I, see, I still see that the two directions of the conditional of as independent project. One is that everything which is conceivable is either possible or impossible, and everything which is either possible or impossible is conceivable. And well, so look, everything are either possible or impossible. Let's agree with that. So to say everything is possible or impossible is conceivable, and say that everything is conceivable. Right? That's what I argued for. Yeah. Now the converse is everything is conceivable is possible or impossible, is that right? That strikes me as a, a kind of logical truth because everything is either possible or impossible. So that, that just strikes me as very interesting. <coughs> but that that this strikes me as different from your first point, which is about the role of impossible worlds in the analysis of conditionals, hyper-intentionality, and so on. I, mean, I agree with, with that, absolutely. All right. Is, is it a problem? No. Uh, I'll speak. Uh, I have the questions. The first one is formal. The second one is conceptual. The yeah. one is the other. Uh, the first one is, I know from one of the courses that there's, I don't know if it's a minus or L or whatever, but the first world was normal, and the second world, uh, Basically, assign an arbitrary truth value to all more or less, and yes. one correct. Okay, uh, that was not quite right, but that's almost right. Okay, 
But um, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what you want to say. <laughs> uh, what difference would your system make in purely for four models? Okay, so um, look, um, th there's a species of modal logic called non normal modal logics. Those are, these are logics weaker than K. And what you have is a bunch of non normal worlds, which are just an old fashioned term for impossible worlds. Um, and then depending upon the non-normal logic that you're interested in, you put some constraints on how modal formulas behave at non-normal worlds. Now, in S0.5, well, in what I think you're referring to as L, you assign arbitrary truth values to modal formulas. That's box and diamond formulas. Now, the way that Z worlds go beyond that is by assigning an arbitrary truth, arbitrary truth value not just to modal formulas, but to every formula. Okay? So that's the way it goes beyond the semantics of normal, sorry, usual non-normal modal logics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But doesn't that simply mean that uh, I can make an emulation of that in uh, L if I assume uh, that from my actual world I have access to all the abnormal worlds? Uh, no, no, because um, the L is not going to satisfy the secondary directive. There, uh, I mean, in every world, in, in, in the state of non-normal logics, Every world you access, whether it's normal or non-normal, where A is true, A or B is true. So it doesn't satisfy the primary direct, secondary directive. In the same world. Correct. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, basically, you're smuggling uh, some form of very consistent or logical elements. In, no. Uh, oh. I told you, you can be a classic logician. <laughs> <laughs> You can buy everything I've said and be a classical illusion because validity is defined as truth preservation at the actual world, or if you like, at all possible worlds. But we have a world where A is true, yet A or B is not true. Correct. It's not possible. But in non normal modal logics, you define validity as truth preservation not over all worlds, but over all normal worlds, over all okay. possible worlds. Now, you, if you do that, and you characterize possible worlds in the way that I told you you could as a possible logician, the consequence relation is classical logic. Where things behave non-classically is at impossible worlds. And you can have those. I've told you how to have them. I'm not threatening your classical faith no, no, today. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you, you took over enough. Oh, tell me. <laughs> because well, I, I, I how, how do I go further? It's <laughs> 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 not kind of the possible worlds that you, that are used to model, uh, like or what, uh, like I have this uh, informational view of logic, and I want an impossible world where I can model what happens when my system fails, when it explodes, when I have too much data on the system and I cannot manage it. I use as, I use those impossible worlds where I, where I have fewer contradictions, like uh, more data than I can fit in my structure, to model failure states. And I use those possible states or worlds, rather, whatever, and analogy to model what happens when the system fails, so I can make them fail well. Okay. So what, why do you want to call these things possible worlds? I don't want them to. I want impossible worlds. I just don't think <laughs> okay. you, you make your possible okay. worlds possible no, or not. Well, that, that's fine. Look, okay. I mean, if you're a classical logician, you will take the possible worlds to be the classically possible ones. Yeah, yeah. If you're a pair of consistent logicians, you'll be more um, generous. I mean, I'd be more generous, okay? You can certainly do that, no problem. Now, just choose a class of possible worlds. Um, that's no problem. The, the, the main point I wanted to make today is you can add all this stuff, okay, and be a classical logician. And I reckon if you're a classical logician, you need this stuff for exactly the reasons that Alexander, Alexander mentioned, namely to do with hypertextuality, Etc. Counterfactuals, etc. Et okay, now the scope of the question is. Uh, oh, so are we are running now. Okay, it's good because <laughs> I'm uh, at risk of idealizing conceivability too, because I know some people whose uh, capacity for conceivability is piece poor, mm -hmm. and I have a struggle with them because I want to talk to them about the condition of spaces and backwards causation yeah. and all things they just cannot conceive. Of. Yeah, remember that my answer to the first question: conceivability is relative to a language I understand. Now, um, it's possible that such people really don't understand your language, okay? I doubt it, but it's just possible. If they say, well, yeah, I really can't understand that, 
I think they're not telling the truth. They're just not trying hard enough. <laughs> okay, that's a, really, a very strong realistic answer. Okay, I get it. Thank you so much. Did your project uh, be summarized by saying that uh, you are creating the logic of considerability? Yeah. Uh, in that sense, uh, you are trying to. Uh, Express what is uh, possible and and possible, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I have uh, and I think that your motivation to do that is to do to go one step further uh, from the logical uh, notion uh, of necessity and possibility, which exists in all logics. But I think that uh, I can have a motivation which is very similar to that one and try to create a logic which is one step further to your to yours. For okay. example, the, the logic that tries to, to take as primitives the conceivability and the inconceivability. Trying to work in possible worlds in which you have the conceivability yeah. and others win. And this is more general and I think well, that I, this I, is I what don't you think want. This, see yet why this is different. Now look, I've given you um, a semantics for language with conceivable and not conceivable. Okay? I've given you the semantics. Now, I've given you one semantics, <coughs> there may be others, I can't deny that. You may have different ones in mind, that's fine. And yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, but I've certainly done what you said, namely giving you a semantics for language which has conceivability and inconceivability as operators. <laughs> conceivability is a modal notion. It's not conceived of, it's conceivable. So it's some kind of possibility operator, and it falls within the, the family of operators. Um, so the semantics I've given you are kind of natural ones. Um, there may be others, of course. And in that sense, uh, we can, I don't know, I uh, have this question, I have this doubt. Uh, this is not like trying to uh, arrive to the lambda which uh, tries to that refers in, that it's referred in Carnap's works. Which Carnap works? Uh, in the Alpha. The Alpha. Alpha. The Alpha. Carnap assumes that. Or in, was, in works, in Putter works, I think. Well, I the, the Alpha right. is not the logical uh, structure language, and it's not the semantics um, process of ontology. I mean, he, he changes over 40 years. Yeah. Um, I think that it's for different than your But I mean, he. He, he assumes that, uh, it, even in his sort of conventional studies, he assumes that logical possibility is classical logical possibility. Um, and when he gives state semantics, state super semantics, which are certainly an early version of possible semantics, he doesn't go beyond the possible words. So um, this is certainly a step beyond anything can't have ever attempted. I think he would be sympathetic to this. Thank you. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I would like to know more about your project because okay. you know if, if you believe that conceivability is possibility, I don't. But if, if, if you believe it, then you can you can get a lot of traction. You can you can argue for a lot of things. It plays a huge theoretical role. Now you want to expand the notion of conceivability so you can conceive in possible worlds. And so far, well, I don't to expand it. I want to say what it is. <laughs> <laughs> You want to have a notion of considerability such that we can conceive impossible worlds. Yeah, because I and think we can. Yeah, fine. So, <laughs> much, I, I so, so far the impression I, I have is that the phenomenon you want to explain is I can bag my fist and say that I can conceive this impossibility. And that's fine, that's something we should explain. Well, I'm not, I didn't just bang my fist, I gave you examples. Well, right, but those examples can be explained in, with I mean, It's not unreasonable to say that Perhaps you were supposing. Now you want to say. I told you, I'm but I'm not. I'm not. Con I'm confusing conceivable exposing. Supposing. I told you why. <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong. No. Okay. Let me put it. Sorry. Let me put it in a more friendly way. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it seems like there's a cost in in uh, having your notion of conceivability. Uh, I mean, certainly someone like Chalmers would think that. Correct. And I would like to understand why why exactly you think that the cost is... Because I've given you all the examples. Okay? 
Chalmers uses the notion to, um, in the first instance, try to justify something he was committed to 10 years before, that's the zombie thought experiment. Okay? And more generally, to give an epistemology for um, modern notions. That's what he wants out of it. Okay? Um, I just think that that's hopeless because, first of all, what he's appealing to is false for the reasons I've given. Now, I haven't given you a story about modal epistemology. That's true. But Chalmers' story is hopeless. Okay? Because, you know, his stuff, he distinguishes between eight different notions of metaphysical possibility, and he thinks that one of them implies, um, sorry, he distinguishes between eight different notions of conceivability, because that one of those entails metaphysical possibility. But that notion is highly idealized. It's what someone who is a, a, um, an ideal reasoner, who knows all a priori truths, um, has an infinite amount of time, an infinite number of pencils and paper can do, right? <coughs> okay, whatever that notion is, it's certainly not one that he or you or I can apply because we're not like that, okay? So maybe there is such a thing, um, but it certainly won't do the job that Dave wants it to do. I mean, if he was here in the audience, he'd be jumping up and down objecting. So I know <laughs> this is controversial, but I told you why I don't believe it, right? I think that's, that's what I want to do. Okay. Um, sure, please. Carlos has something to say. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to say something. Who has the burden of proof? I think this your. I mean, your. Your you didn't have burden of proof. It's your. You know, people you you disagree with. I think they have the burden of proof because because you're assuming that uh, our mental capacities or finite mental capacities can track logical possibility. So there's a, that seems like a very substantive uh, thesis about uh, our cognitive powers. And that seems that well, I'm, I'm not suggesting they can't track some possibilities. I don't think they can track every possibility. And for that, you'd have to be God, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The, the, the people you disagree with, they are committed to death. Oh, yeah. Look, I, I think the, the dialectic actually went like this. So Chalmers writes this book on the philosophy of mind uses a zombie thought experiment. Now, I can think, I can conceive this, therefore it's metaphysically possible. And then people said to him, hey, you know, the fact that you conceive it doesn't mean it's metaphysically possible. And he realized there are all these problems with the thesis, you know, the, the counter example I've given you. So he, he does what, you know, most people do when they find this situation, and they draw distinctions. <laughs> so we've got this great taxonomy of conceivability. Um, but in the end, I don't think this works because, you know, what he ends up with is this hyper-idealized notion. So, you know, okay, he can conceive of zombies. Can God? Well, I don't know. You know, because then there's lots of a priori stuff that Dave doesn't know, that God does. God's an infinite reason that Dave isn't. You know, so even for this sort of hyper-ideal, maybe there's some notion of conceivability, which I, is this hyper-idealized notion. I don't think it'll do what Dave wants. But I'm sure if he was here, he'd be sort of, you know, objecting fiercely. Okay, um, there, but we are running out of time, so could we make them short and quick and easy? Sure. This is just to clarify, it's mm. probably a basic question. Okay. Um, okay, so basically you're saying that the impossible worlds are worlds in which things that we normally would think is are impossible happen, but we can actually conceive them. Yeah. Okay. And that if we cannot conceive them, it's probably because we don't have the language or the understanding to do so. Are you not trying hard enough? Or that. <laughs> so in, in those cases, imagine we have a person that exactly doesn't really understand something, then that person couldn't conceive that. So for that person, it, it would be like a, a, a much more impossible world. Okay, look, right. I've said everything I can conceive, I, everything I can understand, I can conceive. Now, what you're asking about is the converse of that. Is it the case that everything I can, can see, I can understand? Oh. I've been trying to think that's true too. Okay, so if, uh, if someone doesn't understand, then probably for them, there's uh, even more impossible world because he cannot even like imagine yeah, those things. Yeah. And, and that would be subjective, like. 
Yeah. So that means for every person who doesn't understand something, that would be an impossible, a much more impossible world. Well, okay, look, there's a space of impossible worlds. Mm -hmm. I've tried to describe what that is. I don't think that varies. Okay? Um, but as I said in answer to the first question, um, knowledge and conceivability are relative to a state of knowledge and in the last instance, a person and agent. Okay? So um, that is going to, what, what the person understands or conceives is going to be relative to the time, their mental ability and so on. And in general, that is going to carve out a proper subspace of this big W. Okay? So Jesus was okay. Well, uh, firstly, uh, many thanks for your excellent talk. I have two questions, two general questions, and one comment that I think uh, have uh, one relationship with them. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the really use um, of modeling the impossible? This is the, my first question. Mm -hmm. My second question is, uh, do you really think that we need to model the impossible, uh, because uh, I think uh, one thing is to take the impossible uh, like a consequence of our uh, mathematical or logical structures, and other thing is uh, to support the thought the, 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 the impossible uh, is one kind or one single object. In, in this case, well, uh, we have to model it, but I really uh, think that uh, these questions are quite different. So require uh, a difference, very different answers too. Uh, I mean, uh, um, what is the advantage? What is what is a uh, 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 What, uh, when you are talking about the, the impossible, like object or like concept, uh, in these cases, what allowed us to learn about the world when uh, we want to describe uh, the world? Uh, what is the function, what is the application of the notion of the object, the impossible? Okay, the first question I understand um, so why do you need a theory of possible worlds? Well, first of all, to understand conceivability, but then there are all the applications that Alexander mentioned, counterfactuals with the logical impossible antecedents, uh, and other hypercontextual notions, such as belief. Okay? So that's the answer to that question is simple. I'm not sure that I understand the second question. Uh, the second question is, well, if, if we admit the, the concept of the, of the object, the impossible, uh, um, uh, with that concept or with that object, we can to describe better the reality. What is the necessity about uh, talking about of this of this of this concept? So, if you want to understand what the world is like, you do mathematics, or you do physics, or you do economics. Well, but okay. in, the, in the process, you have to consider, you have to imagine impossibilities. So, when I, as a mathematician, imagine Goldberg conjecture and its negation. One of those things I'm imagining is logically impossible. I need to do that in order to investigate the mathematics of it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't. Uh, I don't see really clear what is the uh, the. But it, this concept is really important to to talk about the reality. Uh, well, look. Do Do you think mathematics is? And I think reality? at this point. It, have the properties, epistemic, epistemic properties, and, and logical but, but properties. Look, and I mean, if you're properties. only interested in reality, why do you even consider possibility? If you're only interested in what is actually the case, why do you consider possible worlds at all? Oh, so can, can we move to the question? <laughs> <laughs> So many people still, and so no time. So, Axel, please. Are you sure? Yeah. Wait, um, yeah, I'm sorry to insist on this, but um, okay, so I think you've given us very good reasons to reject the idea that only what is metaphysically possible is conceivable, because you've given all this example. 
But couldn't somebody just say, well, all you are warranted to then is just to an existential claim that some impossible things, metaphysical impossible things, are conceivable, but not that everything you can understand. No, this, this, is, this is true. Okay, so I gave you some concrete examples um, of impossible things that I can conceive or imagine. Okay, now that doesn't imply that everything I can conceive, uh, yeah, I can imagine everything I can say. That's true, that, that takes it a step further. Okay, um, and I didn't really argue for that claim except to say that, hey, you tell me something that I can understand and I reckon I can imagine mm -hmm. it just because I think imagination is really just bringing something that I understand before the mind. Okay, okay? now I'm very happy to listen to counter examples <laughs> to that if you have any. Okay, but, okay so, so what I think what Ricardo and Claudia were getting at is that we have this phenomena that you would still need to account for, which is that normal, intelligent, rational people report to not being able to conceive things that they clearly understand and that when you go like, well, you haven't tried hard enough, it's, it's re I, I cannot fathom what I would, how let, would that let, go around to that person tell me, you, let, let, me, let me tell you a story, okay? okay? <laughs> this was back in Oxford in the 1960s, okay? There was an Australian philosopher, Brian Medlin, who was talking to Oxford and he was defending the mind-brain identity theory, which was coming out of Australia at the time. So, in his talk, he explained the mind-brain identity theory. At the talk, he was some Oxford philosopher put the hand up and said, well, you know, um, young Australian philosopher, um, I don't really understand what it could possibly be for a thought of Vienna to be two inches behind your eyeball, and Brian said, "Get your understanding rewired." <laughs> oh, okay, so you're going to move then the bird into the notion of understanding. Try it. Look, understand. Look, no, no. Let, let, let me give you more serious one. <laughs> understanding, <laughs> understanding is is frame relative. So if you only understand Newtonian dynamics, you cannot understand what it'd be like for time to go backwards. It just doesn't make sense. If you want to understand what it means for time to go backwards, you have to change framework, okay? So you have to understand how special relativity works. Now, I think when the people you've described say, well, I really can't understand that, that's because they're working in a framework which kind of rules it out. So what they have to do is change to a different framework which doesn't. Okay, I, I don't think I've got time to reply, so. Yeah, sorry. I'll go, please. Well, it's actually, it was uh, the same doubt, so let me take a vision to ask you about uh, whether you have an opinion. If, I mean, I, I don't have read the spectrum, whether there could be uh, in the world or in the space possibilities, uh, sort of ineffable, inexpressible oh. uh, propositions. Okay, um, I think this is a different question. Yeah, but <laughs> I, my, second point, my second point was the same that uh, you uh, you, you put convincing examples of uh, mm. conceiving possibilities, but not every, not everything. So not no, everything that's just true. Uh, look, um, if, if something's ethical in a language I understand, I reckon I can imagine it. Okay? Could there be things I can imagine which are ineffable? Well, I didn't try to answer that question. Uh, this is hard because you know talking about ineffability is kind of hard in the first place mm -hmm. um, But it may well be that there are things which are ineffable that I can imagine But now we have to talk about what ineffability means mm -hmm. well, there is a, I know there is a philosopher I've come to be as we can But I don't yeah, know There are not quite a lot of philosophers who've written on the ineffable mm -hmm. okay. I don't know. <coughs> okay. okay, so do you have this? Okay, I'm, I'm wondering how one of two things fit together. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, showed right at the beginning, you're going to tell us we could conceive of the impossible. Okay. Um, but um, just about everything you said seemed to have stronger consequences than okay. um, that. That maybe we can conceive of um, anything we can describe or anything we can bring before our minds. And then the formal modeling seemed to fit with something stronger than that as well. So. Yes. Did I get it right that like yes, yes. conceivable fires through just in case fires through some world? Yes, okay, so the, the, the first comment was kind of warm up. I want to give people like that. 
an orientation where we're going. And what I said was you can see what's impossible. Okay. Um, then we got to the sort of safer, I made that more precise, which is I can see the the, the con, con, conceivability is just accessible to any world, okay? Which is, um, well, the relationship of that to the Walmart claim is, you know, we could discuss. Um, and then, you know, when I was asked the question about, uh, um, does that, I, I modified that in answer to the first question, which really made me spell out uh, that, it's not just any possibility, it's any possibility to understand. Yeah, okay, so let me, um, I feel like two things pulling in opposite directions. So okay. one, one thought is with the, um, the formal modeling stuff, I'm wondering why you don't just have, instead of some modal operator, um, just a one place truth functor that maps any statement to the true. And then when I look at the description that's like bringing some statement um, um, that describes the situation before the mind, I start to wonder if like, some descriptions are too long, and if that's going to stop things being conceivable. Um, I, I don't actually see how this is supposed to work until. So, so we've got this one place operator, the varium operator. So yeah. the varium really, I think, is, is the true. Got that. Isn't, they gonna think... be, isn't it going to be the case that for well, any, you, any you sense got... there's a world where it's true, given your extension of the class of the environment? Um, well, There's going to be some model, right? How do I model the true? So the verum, it takes in any input and gives you the true as an output. Okay? Oh, no, I was thinking it was a one-place one. Then. It okay. takes any statement and gives yeah. you and conceivably gives you... that thing as the output. <coughs> oh, <laughs> conceivably. Oh. So one, one oh, thing, I'm see, wondering, I is see. anything conceivable, not just logically impossible things? Right. And on the other hand, I'm wondering about things where the sentence is too long. Okay, so the, okay. So, um, the story I've told, modulo the understanding of it, is going to work exactly the same as the real operator. Okay, so why didn't I just come in here and say that? Because I reckon conceivability has an interesting internal structure. Okay, so it's, I mean, the real operator can do all kinds of things. The conceivability is a modular motion. So it should behave more like modal than like negation. Yeah. So it should behave like a modal operator. I mean, it's conceived at all. Okay. So it has an important internal structure that's worth you know, thinking through. Okay. And then the worry about that fitting with the informal characterization of conceivability, like bringing before the mind some statement that describes the situation. <coughs> Maybe some statements are too long to bring before my mind. Yeah. Um, the formal thing's going to make them conceivable, but this intuitive one's not going to. Yeah, so this again takes us back to the very first question. Uh, I said it's got to be expressed in a language I can understand. So, so I do understand. Sorry? But I do understand the language, it's just the sense is too long. Well, okay, I mean really understand. Now there's, there's, a, there's a logician's conceit that we can understand arbitrary long sentences. I, I'm not sure that linguists think that. Okay? Um, if the linguists are right, then you've got to restrict the language in question to the fragment that I can understand. And that, I mean, uh, you might well have to do that. I agree with that. Okay. So the things that come out as conceivable and full model that aren't really conceivable. If you go with the infinite language, which is of course what logicians normally do. Well, it doesn't have to be. I mean, so the, the sentence doesn't have to be. Right? Well, it has to be arbitrarily long. So it's like all formal languages, this modal logic has formulas of argument. Okay, uh, and if you're the kind of person who thinks that you know we're just too dumb to understand things of arbitrary length, which is probably true, um, then you're going to have to restrict the language right at the start to things which are understandable. Okay, so there are two more questions. One is about the major questions, and then you answer. Sorry? There are two more questions. Yes. So why not let them make them questions and then you answer to one of them? Because I'll forget. Really? <laughs> okay. Well, I need them. I never oh. raised my hand, did I? Oh, really? That's a very good question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a lot of questions, but mm -hmm. now I well, just one. Um, I was thinking about 
the dialectic possibility and physical possibility. And if I can remember, you give us an example to about saying to both people, no, two people different, that you will be in different places at the same time. And I was thinking if in that sense it's necessary the, possi the physical possibility to the dialectic possibility. Um, much as I'd love to be able to be in two places at once, I can't do it. Yeah, okay. well, that's a physical impossibility. Uh, I'm kind of tempted to think it's a logical impossibility too. But uh, I, I don't know um, what is the, the relation, it, well, it, <coughs> there are a relation between physical possibility and dynamic possibility, or I they are completely different. I, I think that lots of things uh, that you can become obliged to do are physically impossible if you're stupid enough to promise. Okay. <laughs> I think that lots of things you can promise to do are logically impossible. So, you know, I, I promise you that I'm going to um, show that Goldbach's conjecture is true. And you say to me, Graham, okay, you've promised me. Um, if you do it, I'll give you a hundred bucks. <laughs> Okay. I give you a hundred bucks, right? <laughs> but I've made the promise, we've got to bet, okay? It turns out that Goldbart's conjecture is false. So I promise to do something that's logically impossible, let me prove it. Okay, so I, I certainly can promise logical impossibilities. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have something to say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So thank you very much. Um, all of you for coming, and see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Yeah, another question. Oh, another question. Sorry. Yeah, well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, do you think that there is a relation in your work or your project between living and work? In the sense that you're putting off, like, in a bag, the possibilities and the impossibilities of what we can conceive, uh, anything that, is, that we cannot conceive, Simply is not rational, and we can put it into a logic and we can understand. So, we're talking about the big and show the track takes us not the investigations. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, if you're, I think that you're making like a, that you're putting the limits for, uh, for all the facts that we can even think, conceive. Well, well, the question is how that relates to big and show. Now, first question, we're talking about. Vicky Shine the Tractators or Vicky Shine the Tractators? Vicky the Tractators. Vicky Shine operates with the closest possible words. Um, I can't remember if and where in the Tractators he talks about conceivability. But I'm inclined to think that he thinks that I'm in the possibility is conceivable. Well, I'd have to go back and check the Tractators. So if that's right, then this is a different from the tractators. possible makes sense. And it's, yeah, I think that's right. Only, only the possible, in fact, only the contingent makes sense in some sense. Um, so if it doesn't make sense, you can't consider that. Good, that's, thank you, that's right. And um, if you think that, we, we would say that we're just saying what well, are the facts of that. We can conceive about the facts, but not the sense about the facts. Because I'm, I'm not following. Just what well, make the things be those things, it will be outside them, right? So sorry, I'm still not following. It's like I mean the metaphysics way. When we are not saying just that that's possible or or impossible, we're saying what why is it like that? In fact, well, that we cannot even. I don't know if you I, can, I think reality contains actuality, possible worlds, and impossible worlds. Now, how do we know which ones are possible? Well, for that, you need a story of knowing the crystal Okay? Now, I've rejected a standard story, namely that modern possibilities is delivered by imaginability. Okay? I haven't given you another story. That's a topic for another talk.
Um, but it's a separate issue. What's reality like? How do you know what it's like? One's metaphysical, one's epistemological. <coughs> So, yeah, we have no more time for this. I'm so sorry, but we should have finished 15 minutes before. So, um, thank you very much, Rahan. So, that's the we'll be speaking on Wednesday um, in the Seminario de Investigadores and on Friday, right? Friday of day or so. So see you tomorrow, tomorrow at 10 a.m. Mario Lovas will be speaking on Herorian arguments and logical consequences. <laughs>